in no way am I a Assemblies of God Pentecostal, but I think I almost started speaking in tongues at one portion in that. But let me speak in the tongue that I have, and I hope I can communicate clearly what is in my heart and in my soul. Our scripture passage this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. So hear this good word about healing and about gratefulness. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan of all people. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Rise and go, because your faith has made you well. Henry Ford once said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Our beliefs, more than anything else, drive everything we do. Some of those beliefs are conscious beliefs. Some of them are unconscious. But if you ever ask yourself, why in the world do I keep doing this when it keeps screwing up my life and everyone else is around me? That's a great question. You may want to pursue it with everything that you have to discover what that answer is. Our beliefs drive us. The story tells us there were ten men who had leprosy, which could also just mean they had bad skin conditions as well. And they stood at a distance, and they said, Master, have pity on us. Now, why would they stand at a distance? Because it was their culture that if you had certain diseases, that you were unclean, and that if you went into public and even touched someone, they became unclean. Or if you touched something and then they touched it after you, they would become unclean. So they stayed at a distance out of respect and out of their culture. So not only do you have a disease that's debilitating, but now you also find because of your disease, you're also isolated. So they stood at a distance and said, Jesus, have pity on us. Jesus then told them, go show yourselves to the priest. Now, this is kind of a strange way to do a healing, isn't it? Well, let's get some background information. See, in Jesus' mind, they were already in the process of being healed. But in his culture, if you have a disease which you have been deemed unclean, you had to go show yourself to the priest and go through a ritual cleansing which then would allow you to go back into society and integrate with everyone there. So this is why Jesus was sending them on their way. While they were on their way to see the priest, they noticed that their diseases were healed. And one returned. One returned. Fell at Jesus' feet, which is, means that he, he, he humbled himself completely. And he was praising God. And he was thanking God. And he was showing gratitude. Now, when I was looking at this passage, one of the things that stood out to me the most was the ten men with skin diseases had a sense that Jesus was a miracle worker and that he was someone very special. And while they were in their disease, they stayed at a distance. But when this one man experienced healing and was becoming whole, now he finds himself not at a distance, but close to Christ, close as his feet. You see, when we find ourselves plagued with whatever disease it is we have, that we think we are lesser than, that we think that we are impure, or that we think we are unclean, God seems to be at a long ways away, right? It's the God of Genesis chapter 1, the God that's out there somewhere who just speaks things and things happen. 
But whenever we discover our becoming whole and we are grateful for it, we find that God is as close as Jesus' feet. There is no distance between him and Jesus now. Then Jesus says this, Rise, go, for your faith has made you well. When I was reading this passage in the Greek, I found something very interesting. It is translated correctly. But the Greek word for faith is also could also be translated as belief. And the Greek word for well can also be translated as whole. Your faith has made you well. Your belief has made you whole. This is what I want us to focus on today, is our beliefs. Your beliefs can make you sick. Your beliefs can make you well. I find that so many people that I encounter, especially through counseling, have very toxic beliefs about themselves. Some they inherited, some that they came up with all their own. For much of my life, I also had toxic beliefs about myself. Have you ever met someone who desperately wants to be in love? and be in an intimate relationship, and they just want someone to love them for who they are, and they meet this person, and they're just on cloud nine, and you're so happy for them because everything this time seems to be going well. And then you see them a year later and say, how is so-and-so? They say, ah, I broke up with them. Why did you break up with her? Well, I figured eventually she'd figure out who I really was, and I thought I would beat her to the punch. So I went ahead and broke up with her before she would break up with me and just get it over with. And I just looked at him and said, don't you know that maybe the person who has loved you for a year loved you for who you were? Have we ever known anybody? Of course, somebody else, none of us here would do such a thing, but they worked so hard in school and they worked hard in their in their in college and they worked hard, they got into their, their dream job and they work from the bottom and they're working for themselves right up to the top and there's an opportunity to become a VP in this company and everybody knows you're going to get offered the job and you're prepared for the job you'll be great for it and then you go to the boss's Christmas party in the house of the CEO and you hit on her husband and you are drunk beyond measure and now you have no job. Why in the world would a person do this? Because in their heart, they believe they don't deserve it. If you're here this morning and you all consistently find out, uh, consistently experience, why do I sabotage? It's a good question. Find out why. Let me help you. Or I can refer you to someone who can help you. You need to find out why. Sometimes we know. Sometimes we just don't feel like we deserve it. We feel like we're lesser than. We don't deserve love. We're actually afraid to be loved. We don't deserve to have what we want. And we don't deserve to be happy. Where did these beliefs come from? I promise you, you were not born with them. And it's important that we do all that we can to, to replace the toxic beliefs with the healthy ones. When I was the men's aftercare counselor at, the, at Phoenix South the Men's Residential Recovery Center for the Center for Drug Free Living, which now is known as Aspire, the greatest challenge for me as a counselor, for all of our staff, was to help the client make the transition from I am a mistake to I made mistakes. If your belief is I am a mistake, you will validate that belief day after day after day. You will attract people in your life who will constantly remind you, you are a mistake. When we'd get to the point with most all of them, when we'd get to a point where we could help them make that transition from I am a mistake, oh, I have made mistakes, and now I am becoming whole, something flip, flips on in their eyes. It's like a switch. Everyone I've ever counseled in my whole life, I've seen it with every single one. They come in, their eyes are kind of glazed, they're sad, they're depressed, and then they make this discovery that I am somebody, that I am loved, that I am worthy of every gift that life brings me. 
and a switch clicks on and their eyes bright up. And where they're recovering, they have been going like this for months. Then it goes like that. When that belief changes. Toxic beliefs keep us at a distance from God and from our spiritual selves and from the love of Christ. We, we yell from a distance, have pity on us. We hope that somehow God will find a way through the great chasm of my unworthiness to bring healing to my heart. But that's not how it works, you see. God is not way out there. God is right here. We just have to have the ability to see it and to open our heart and our soul for the possibility that even I can be lovable. And even I can be successful. And even I can make a difference in this world. Even I can be responsible. See? And when our beliefs change and we experience the healing, then we discover that God was not out there, but God is right here and we humble ourselves in gratitude. second part of the passage is gratitude. Weren't, nine, weren't ten healed and only one came back? Gratitude. WebMD shares that people who live in a state of gratitude are healthier people. And there's a difference. All of us are at some times grateful for something, but I'm talking about people who live in a constant state of gratitude. They tend to have less stress. They tend, not, they tend to take better care of themselves. They tend to be more careful in their relationships. Because they're grateful. Even though they may be tempted to sabotage it, they're not going to because they're too grateful for what they have and what they experience. A state of gratitude. One of the books that helped me to learn this lesson most profoundly it was called The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. And it's a parable about a young man who wants to marry this woman, but he doesn't have enough money. He doesn't have a treasure to offer. So he goes on this long journey. I won't tell you how it all goes because I want you to read the book. But the alchemy was, al to be an alchemist was to be able to take an element like lead and turn it into gold. And if you can do that, you can be rich, right? But it's a parable about spiritual alchemy. Let me discover what is led in my own spirit. And going through a process, let me change that into gold. And one of the things that I learned about this, this book is to look for the gold in every situation. I promise you, no matter what you have experienced or you are experiencing, if you consciously look for the gold in that situation, you will discover. I know it's true. Hear me now, believe me later, all right? It's true. I have done this. When I had polymyalgia for two years, it was extremely painful. And I said, what is the gold in this? And the gold in this is I learned how to accept kindness from others. I allowed myself to accept love from a community of faith. And it transformed my soul. I needed to slow down for two years. And stop spending so much time giving, giving, giving. And learn how to open my heart and my soul to receive. And it transformed. Your love transformed my soul. It made me a better Barton. You see. Gratitude. Living in a state of. One of the things that I love. Believe it or not. Even though I do not have a tattoo on my body. Are custom motorcycles. Choppers. Since I was a little boy, easy rider, all right? You got to admit, that was cool, right? I had the poster on my wall. The gas tank was in fluorescent light, paint so that when I turned the light off and had my black light on, you know who? Black light, anybody? Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cold in the dark, right? But another thing that I love is art and sculpture, and I love to see people take raw materials and form them and fashion them into something that's beautiful. And that's why I love watching people build custom motorcycles. And Discovery Channel had this, this program called Biker Build-Off. And they would take these, these high-end 
top of the line custom bike builders and they put them in a competition. And without fail, every time, the, de the designer and the builder who would fabricate everything on his bike would win the contest. Now, the big thing about it, because it's reality TV, you have to have drama, right? There's got to be drama. And drama would be they had to build in 30 days what it normally take them three to six months to build, all right? So that's, ooh, time, oh, oh, problems, we're behind schedule, oh, oh, oh. So you would see some biker builders cheat, and they had stamped out designs they had created, and there's just a machine stamped out the gas tank, and a machine stamped out the, the, the fender, and they would just alter it just a little bit here or there. But it was the bikers who would take the metal, and they would pound it, and they would shape it, and they would form it, and they would, those are the ones who won every time. One of my favorite builders is a guy named Indian Larry. He's deceased now. But as I watched him build bikes, he taught me a beautiful lesson about gratitude and living in the state of. He grew up in a middle-class family, a heavily uh, a, a disciplinary father who wanted him to be a carpenter like him, but Larry was an artist it's in spirit, and he was sensitive to things, and he was mischievous. He was a free spirit, and he didn't fit in the prescribed world in which he found himself. He went to a Catholic school with, because he didn't, he wasn't a good boy every day. They beat, the nuns would beat his knuckles so much that they would be bloody and swollen, and he would tell his parents he got into a fight. They would lock him in a closet to teach him a lesson. Well, needless to say, school was not a lot of fun for Larry. So he quit school at age 17 and went to California to go live with his sister who was living there. While he was there, he got into drugs. His sister was murdered. He came back home. It was devastating for him because she was a free spirit like he was, and he thought he had lost the only person on this planet who kind of understood who he was. In order to support his drug habit, he decided to start robbing banks, and he got caught and he got arrested. And while he was in prison, he spent as much time as he could in the metal shop. He learned how to weld. He learned how to fabricate. He learned how to repair engines. He learned how to build engines. He had a passion for these things. He also started to repair his mind and that he had his mother bring him books and philosophy and the classics. And he read and he just absorbed everything he could. He got his GED while he was in prison. When he was a youth, he was doing something in his basement that involved explosives. We won't go into details, but he blew off his little finger. So Larry had to overcome heroin addiction. He had to overcome prison. He had to overcome so many things. And when I saw him, was at the prime of his life. And I remember as he's building his bike, he never worried about time. Uh, Indian Larry, aren't you worried about getting now? He said, um, I don't do time anymore. Think, okay, that's where I want to be in life. I want to, I want to no longer have to deal with time. I got to experience it a little bit during my sabbatical. It took about three months to get there, and then I had a month to enjoy it. But I still hope to get there someday. I said, but Larry, how about you, you know, you don't have a finger on your left hand. How? I said, well, it was traumatic when it happened, but, you know, I can get to places and when I'm repairing an engine with these three fingers a lot easier than I could if I had four. Also, sometimes you need to polish something in a small place, and I can do it with these three fingers so much easier. So, yeah, actually, it's kind of become a benefit for me. Well, Larry, how about your time in prison? Best thing that ever happened to you. How about the times you were in the hospitalized because you were addicted? Best thing that could ever happen to you. Why is that? Because it made me healthy and it made me whole. And Larry learned how to let all the pain and suffering go and learn how to live in the flow of life and live in the moment. I did not hear a thing from Indian Larry, a man, tattoos all over his whole body, kind of a rough looking guy that I didn't also see in the Gospels or saw in great philosophers. Same lesson. Living in a state of gratitude opens our heart and our soul so that we can receive what we did not think was possible. So that we can be close and intimate with that which we thought was distant and far away. 
when we go through the process of changing our toxic beliefs, it starts the process of making us whole and complete. None of us here are a mistake. I don't care what anybody tells you. No one here is a mistake. And some of us are misfits. That's what kind of makes this church unique. We're a normal bunch of misfits. It seems to be an oxymoron, but it isn't. That's why we respect each other so much, because we didn't belong in other places. And we couldn't seem to fit in. Everybody here loves your weirdness. I'm not weird. Okay. If you say so. I know I'm weird. And you love me anyway. You see. And it's that kind of love and that kind of openness and that allows us to start the process that changing the toxic beliefs. I am ugly. The toxic beliefs. I am no good. The toxic beliefs. I can never be perfect. The toxic beliefs, the only way someone is going to accept and love me is if I am perfect. The toxic beliefs, I do not deserve happiness. The toxic beliefs, I want success, but I don't deserve success. Toxic beliefs, I want to be close to God, but I will never be close. That's something for everybody else. I remember a pivotal point in my own recovery, in my own life experience, where I was able to say, I now preach about what I know is true rather than what I hoped was true. Because that divine spirit that is just so magnificent is no longer out there but here. I experience the divine each and every day in so many ways. And I am grateful. And I am grateful that you allow me to share with you whatever I've learned and whatever I experienced in hopes that it will help you and we help each other to know fully what it means. Your belief has made you whole. Once upon a time, I thought that if I just loved somebody completely and just gave it all away, that they would love me back. Here's what I learned about that. This is simplistic, I know, but we don't have a lot of time. In this world, there seem to be givers and there seem to be takers. Givers only find purpose in, unless they're giving. And takers feel that they need to be taken care of. So it's a perfect train wreck. And what I discovered is that I gave and hoped that they would give back as they took everything I had. And then when they sucked me dry, they went and found somebody else. What I've learned when I changed my belief and I believe that I am a person who is lovable. I am a person who has the capacity to give and to receive love unconditionally. I am a person who has talents and gifts. I am a person who does not need to prove myself anymore to be loved or to be accepted. When I made that change, now when I love, I don't do it because I hope you love me back. I love because I just do it. See, I share my passion. I share my, my experience. I share the gospel. I proclaim everything that I learned, not because I'm hoping you will accept me and like me. Ooh, that part, he sh part, we sure do like you. I do it because I'm hoping that my life, my experience can help you in your life, in your experience. You see? I had to work so hard. I, I, I wish changing toxic beliefs was as easy as going to go see the priest. I would have visited a priest every day. And the Bible stories, it's fast. In reality, you have to want it more than anything else in life. More than anything else. Oh, but I have a family. No, I promise you, you do the work and you will appreciate your family much, much more. You will love your children much, much better. You will be happier in your job or your, what you do and you volunteer. You will become, as we become whole people because our beliefs are healthy, then life becomes a whole different experience altogether. Find the gold. Live in gratitude. And when we do this, what we discover is the God that we thought was far off is as close to us with every breath we take. 
pneuma, spirit, breath, and whatever beat of our heart, life. Thus ends the lesson. Let us pray. Beautiful, gracious God, thank you for your patience. And we know you are patient because you love us, because we are a part of you. We are a facet of your imagination. We know that you are patient and full of mercy and grace because you see you in us and hopes that someday we will see you in us. I am so sorry that there are so many messengers on this earth who believe that their job is to tear people down. But thank you for placing in my mind, in my heart, and thank you for all the experiences that I have had, some not so great, some glorious, most in between, that you have called on me to help others see how beautiful they are. Thank you for grace and love, compassion, and kindness, and indeed we are grateful. Amen.